welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Mike Yost. Mike is a senior engineer at Pratt Whitney. Mike, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Spencer. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to have you. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a while. I appreciate you uh, coming on. Yeah, no, this is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. So um, you're an aerospace engineer, and I don't know that many of those. Um, and I guess we started to talk at dinner a little bit about like how you ended up here and I think we were talking about like grad school and like when you were just getting out and sort of how you ended up in aerospace. Yeah, yeah. So, so controls, I guess, was competing. Yeah. Um, so I obviously I went to Michigan for an engineering degree um, and I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do with it when I started. Um, it's kind of funny if you ask any of my, my old housemates, they'll tell you that I was going to be every single type of engineer by the time I ultimately picked aerospace. You know, I, I thoroughly considered all of them. Nice. Um, I was similar in undergrad. Yeah, I just, I've always been interested in all of it, and so it's really hard to have to pick one. And, and I stayed up for a while, and I thought about it, but um, I remember I went to this one presentation that the College of Aerospace Engineering uh, had, and I was like, this is, seems like something that I could study for four years and graduate with. And I was like, that's probably good enough for someone who's 18, 19 years old. You know, it doesn't take much to go off of at that point. So um, I picked it took a few entry classes in in sophomore year and I ended up sticking with it the whole time and I really liked it. Um, you know, it was a good pick. And nice. so I got my undergrad in aerospace engineering, but I remember at the time I didn't have any, you know, significant co-ops or internships in the aerospace industry. And I, I did want to go to a job. I, I kind of figured out I didn't want to do a PhD. I didn't want to go into research. So grad school, right? You know, I was like, let's double down. At Michigan, if you stick around with a high enough GPA... That's a good box to tick on your way to the job market. Yeah, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you stick around with a high enough GPA, they'll give you the master's degree in an extra fifth year. So I stuck nice. around for the fifth year, got the master's degree, and by that point, um, you know, I, I kind of lucked out a little bit more in the job market, and, and this, this opportunity with Pratt Whitney came up. So, um, yeah, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do in aerospace engineering. Like I said, I, I had started off in controls, um, and that... Really was uh, it was something I liked, but I also knew that I could do this aerodynamics component to it, and really it's um, it's considered gas dynamics, so they they don't really restrict themselves. Well, I thought air fluid and all that stuff was just fluid dynamics in some form or another. It is so so aerodynamics. I'm saying this is someone that knows no, nothing no, no, about that's, fluid dynamics. That's fine. <laughs> Aerodynamics specifically refers to, you know, fluid flow over surfaces. And sometimes there's a lot more interest in just general fluids, right? So we talk a lot about combustion, right? Yeah. Combustion in a, in, for example, an automotive engine, that's not really a flowing fluid. That's a static liquid in a compressed piston, right? So you're exploding fuel that gives off heat. And eventually the piston expands and moves. So it's considered static before, during, or after it's exploding. They call it constant volume combustion as a, as a short tan. But doesn't it. the volume change when it combusts? It's an approximation. Interrupt. Right? You are waving your hands, right? Constant volume. I'm confused. Right? Piston compresses the gas. Okay. Detonates, or we call it deflagration, but it deflagrates <laughs> in the piston. It's a and great the piston word. expands right with the energy, so, and there is some combustion that continues while the piston is moving. But you know, for combustion purposes at the graduate level, on paper we consider it just you know it's a it's a single chamber, and um, anywho, uh, you know I kind of knew that I was interested in gas dynamics for a while, and you know I I was looking at jobs that specifically might be more interesting. Uh, for an aerospace engineer as opposed to just a general engineer. And um, like I said, this opportunity with Pratt Whitney came up and I thought, this this is it. I like engines. I like working on um, you know aerospace related applications for engines as opposed to automotive. And so you've been doing this right out of school. Yeah. That's cool. And it was a it was a neat opportunity. Pratt Whitney recruited me right out of grad school. Uh, they actually flew me out to Connecticut to interview there at the uh, at the building. Um, and you know, when you're 23 years old, this is a, this is a really a <laughs> interesting place to be. So, you know, I was definitely sold on it there. Um, and I've been with the company ever since. Do you guys make like engines in that facility? 
We, uh, yeah, there's some engines that are built there. That's there's cool. another manufacturing facility um, in Middletown. So I remember when I went to SpaceX, like part of the draw was it was a rocket factory and they were actually making rockets there. <laughs> So that's yeah. why I brought that up. Yeah, at manufacturing yeah. happens at a few different plants, but uh, the Middletown's a big one. Um, and a lot of the design work, though, happens in, in East Hartford. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty neat spot. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, Really cool. Yeah. How'd you, how'd you move away from controls and just more toward the uh, fluid dynamics, aerodynamics? Yeah, stuff? so... If you want to talk about it, you don't have to. At least in aerospace engineering, right, at the University of Michigan, we definitely take controls class. I took a couple of controls classes there. And um, when you're applying to jobs at these career fairs, you know, you, you really are, you're walking around to every table, you're talking to all the recruiters, um, and you're really trying, you know, it is a bit of a competition, right? You have to, you know, present yourself and sell yourself as the man for the job or the woman for the job. Yep. And I uh, like that at Carnegie Mellon too. Absolutely, you know, it's competitive. And um, what I was finding was that, you know, a lot of these positions, they're looking for specific types of engineers, right? So you got your electrical engineers who might have more training for controls jobs um, or take more specialized coursework or have more internship opportunities. And at least in aerospace engineering, I didn't have a ton of opportunities for myself to be able to present to that. Um, a lot of them would say things like, you know, aerospace engineers, like you guys work on the aircraft, you might work on the wings or the engines, you know, you might not necessarily work on, um, you know, the, the, the control systems design, right? So a lot of it came down to me thinking like, okay, like I know I like controls engineering. I know that this is something that I would like to work in eventually, but maybe just to get my foot in the door, I need to really sell myself on, you know, this other aspect of aerospace degrees, which is obviously the, the aerothermal fluid dynamics of it. And so nice. that's, that was the motivation for that. And, uh, makes a lot of sense. It worked a lot better, right? You know, once yeah. I, once I picked up those classes in it and ultimately I did, uh, stuff in a lot of computer programming, uh, while I was there, I did, um, computational fluid dynamics. I did, that's uh, considered computer programming. Yeah, yeah, it's a... Uh, I feel like we have different definitions of some of these words. So, like, <laughs> to me, controls is, like, tuning a servo drive to get where you want it to go with, like, a rotating, you know, end effector on, like, a brushed or brushless rotary motor. Sure. It sounds like for you, controls is, like, getting a rocket pointed in the right direction. In some sense, it is. I At least for the computer programming side, I've always been interested in that. Um, and... To your point, I found that aerodynamics had a lot more programming involved with it than controls did. Yeah. So that was probably another motivation for that, too, on that front. Um, certainly, though, controls, especially like uh, numerical, numerical iterative solutions to controls, like optimal control theory, um, that's like sneaking up on something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's <a> numerical iterative. <laughs> Where you're iterating on a solution, that one's kind of more interesting. Uh, but yeah. at least for a programming perspective, yeah, the, the computational fluid dynamics was a lot more programming focused, and I really appreciated that. That's interesting. I hesitate to even ask because I'm sure I won't know it, but like, what languages do you program in to you know, set up like a computational fluid dynamics solution? Um, this is so far outside my wheelhouse. I'm almost embarrassed to talk about no, it. No, it's I, a lot of the NASA codes are fortran you fucking serious yeah serious that's, that's i mean funny. i remember when i was in grad school i i had looked at a nasa fortran code i think it was like nastran or whatever it was i don't think it was nastran it was i think it was called cfl 3d or something um computational fluid language something like that it, yeah. i know that fortran makes up a lot of it because a lot of these codes are written by like very intelligent researchers with phds uh, who were from the 60s from the 60s yeah <laughs> and the codes get inherited you know over the That's years interesting um code oh, there's some open source ones in c++ so i know that like c++ is used increasingly more um it it's almost always a compiled language right is python popular at all in that field or is that just because it doesn't no. have the oomph it doesn't have the oomph it's yeah. it's python is memory intensive and computationally intensive yeah it seems like what is it like ai people really love python and like physicists really love python like there's certain types of like phd 
scientists, sciencey folks that seem to like really, really love Python. And like to some extent roboticists, like for kinematics, love Python. But it's interesting to know that like people doing fluid dynamics still go to C++ because it's just, you know, more efficient. Yeah, and, and keep in mind too that, you know, fluid... These roboticists like C++ fl too. Yeah, fl fluid dynamics yeah. Sil simulations are, you know, written to be general solvers. And so once you have a general solver, that's it. Like it doesn't change significantly over the What's next What's a general 10, solver in this context? So in this context, right, it all comes back to matrices. You've got a, a matrix that you're trying to numerically solve, right? Or something along those lines. You're, you're iteratively computing a solution slightly better in each iteration until you converge on the correct answer or what you think is the, the or close correct enough, answer. Like close enough, close enough. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So for general matrix solvers, once you write a matrix solver, you know it'll solve any matrix. It doesn't matter if you're solving a finite element method solution it doesn't matter if you're solving you know if you're factoring a matrix out right it's at the end of the day it's just a matrix solver so once you write your matrix solver um you've got most of the pieces there i'm sure that you know people never try to optimize or, or come back and it might but again like linear algebra right when's the last time a major breakthrough has been made and in, in some there are breakthroughs that happen for sure and and there are very intelligent people that solve this stuff slightly faster every year but um, like I said, a lot of the codes are written in Fortran, and, and there's a reason for that. You know, it's, it's the Fortran stuff isn't changing, um, and they, you just inherit this old Fortran solver and you, you use it again and again. That's interesting. Uh, we did it in grad school. Who the fuck is programming Fortran anymore? So yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. Well, well, I guess if you got to <laughs> plug it in and the solver is already built, and that's like your core thing you're building around, right? May as well. Yeah. Add in some Fortran. Now, to be fair, right? At Michigan, we used Python in our courses. Um, okay, but you use that in the courses, but nobody uses that in real life because it's not fast enough to do right. matrix controls. Yep. Yeah, that makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. I mean, it. you know, if you have to run something for homework and it takes eight hours, you know, it's... Nobody cares. Nobody cares, right? It's, yeah. it's a homework problem. The important thing is learning how it works, right? And and if you're trying to, you know, design an autopilot that, that you know, is controlling an aircraft, you probably can't wait eight hours yeah, for nice. that to, <laughs> to figure out where to point the plane. So, you know, it's, uh, it's important to, to get that one right. So I, I have an embarrassing confession to make on that front, which is when I was in grad school, I never actually got good at linear algebra. Like, I, I sort of hacked my way at it to get through the coursework at Carnegie Mellon, but... I never, I never really learned it correctly, and I never did it as an undergrad because I never thought I would need it because I was yeah. an idiot. And so I, um, we, we had this one assignment, which was like to come up with a MATLAB simulation of the MIT, I think it was the Rainbird Hopper. It was like this robot from the 80s that had like a pogo stick and popped up and down on it, and it was a controls problem. Like you had to optimize a bunch of different um, variables in order to get it to walk with like a you know, consistent gait and maintain stability on the uh, the deck and, and do what it had to do. And I, I just wrote like a nested loop that plugged in every possible value. And then I optimized for stability. <laughs> and when I was able to get like the delta of the center of mass to move as little as possible in angle and position, I was like, I, I just optimized for those those numbers. Yeah. And I can't remember if I... I might have just tried every single possible solution. <laughs> and it took like 12 to 20 hours for my computer to run all of it. And I, I just... I, I coded it up soon enough before it was due that I just waited. <laughs> and turned in. <laughs> when it spat out. It was It's so embarrassing in retrospect, but... But it's at the end yeah. of the day, right? It, you know... For homework assignments, for yeah. course projects, right? Unless you're trying to learn how to program a numerical solver, right? It, it, yeah. You know, you're trying. There's other course objectives, and like passing. Up with that. Yeah, like <laughs> passing and getting a degree. Let's talk about that. Um, <laughs> you know, so. But I mean, the, the interesting thing is that computers, 
at the are very very good at solving matrices right that's like their primary focus you know for for scientific computing that's like the number one thing you know it, yeah. it's, it all comes back to a matrix and every science pretty much uses that which i wish someone had told me as an undergrad yeah the finite element method matrix solving a trust structure matrix solving for the lift distribution over a wing matrix it's it, it's sense. all the same stuff it's the same solver robot kinematics is all based off matrices <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> exactly lc circuits matrices well yeah. so yeah it's an interesting one and uh yeah i i took a very interesting course in college called multidisciplinary optimization and it, it's weird because that course has snuck into just about everything that i do um, after I after I graduated, um, not necessarily multidisciplinary optimization, but the things that you learn in that course, right? Which is like an optimal solver. Surprisingly, is one of the most useful things I've ever learned in <laughs> in, in that that aerospace degree. Which is uh, which is you know bizarre because it's not advertised in that course as like vital to. You well, know, that's it. Like it's never what you think is going to be valuable yeah. like, in real life. Is is what is. Like I mean I. I'm trying to think of some of the things I spent time on in school that I never use now. Like, um, I guess, algorithm analysis. Like, I was really good at data structures and algorithm analysis, and I haven't coded in a decade professionally. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I, I, I spent all night one night trying to figure out a way to search numbers ordered in a certain way in, like, a two-dimensional space, and I brought you know, my scribblings to the professor and he offered me a job afterward. <laughs> I was the only undergrad he ever offered a job and I was a freshman because yeah. I, I did that. Um, and so, I don't know. I mean, it, you never know what you're going to use. But I don't use know, that in my like, career at all these days. Yeah. <laughs> like, because if I had to, if I think back on it right, there were probably three courses that stand out as like the ones I use every day, right? You know, aircraft propulsion, shocker. <laughs> uh, the optimization course and um, probably my own data structures and algorithms course. Honestly, nice. I think those are the three that I use the most. And that was I, a fun course. Yeah, and I took classes on structures. I took classes on you know a whole bunch of gas dynamics and, and physics classes for for fluids. Um, I think those classes are very useful for mental models. Uh, if you ever. Um, if you're like listen to Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger. No, I haven't. Charlie Munger, one of Warren Buffett's partner, talks about um, the importance of building mental models for whatever it is you're operating on. Oh, right? that's interesting. So he talks about it in the context of investing, right? The yeah, investors, makes sense. you know, the successful investors. Um, but the importance of having those mental models for whatever it is you're doing, and. What ended up happening for me was these these upper level fluids classes make for awesome mental models for so the So is a mental model just on. intuition or yeah. is it okay. intuition about what's happening and um, you and know why probably thinking like a fluid is probably the strangest thing you'll so hear. So Warren but Buffett thinks like a stock? Sort of. Yeah. I mean it's 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 being able to Charlie you know, Munger. Yeah, to have some approximations for the constraints of the problem, right? So in yeah. investing, they talk about things like, you know, business fundamentals. Do they have a strong leadership foundation? Do they have a market segment How do you that's profitable? That? Well, I guess you have to sort of intuit it. Mental model. Yeah. That's the mental model comes in. You know, you have to, you have, to have a good intuition, a good feeling for it. Same thing with, uh, with the physics problems we work on, right? Flow over a wing, heat transfer in the engine. Um, any of these sorts of concepts are going to be useful in your career. There's no one class that's going to teach you what you need, you know, because nobody, you know, engineering degree is not going to prepare you for your job. It's going yeah, it to <laughs> prepare you for life. And that, and you, in your life, you hopefully, you know, are able to learn what you need to learn. You know, it's, that's how it ends up working out. At least that's how it's been my experience. And it seems like you've been through something similar yourself, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my degree has helped me. I mean, they got me in the door. You know, they, they got me far enough to, I don't know. I always say I learned more in my first six months, like, you know, as a professional than I did in six years of school. Hmm. And, I mean, that's not to knock school. Like, I wouldn't have been able to do any of that without school. Like, nobody would have hired me. Um, and also, you know, I, I 
made a lot of connections and learned a lot of things. But I feel like the pace that you get it at when you're out in you know the real world is just well. I guess it's a few things. I, I don't know that it's necessarily more information faster, but I mean you're you're kind of seeing what's actually relevant and applicable to what you're doing. And and for someone like me, that's kind of like crack cocaine, because you know, you're like, oh, this actually works. I can make money with this. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. And so I mean, I I would say maybe it's just a reinforcement loop where like. You know, in school, you're kind of doing stuff because it's interesting and you enjoy it and you might be good at it. Uh, but then, you know, when you get out in the job market, you're like, oh, I'm getting paid very well to do this. Or, oh, I, um, you know, it turns out I get validation and, and adoration from my peers when I can succeed this way. You know, <laughs> like, love me. You know? and so, Give me a raise. Yeah. <laughs> And so uh, that's so true though right because yeah. you don't know what the keys to your success are going to be beforehand right you know you can like connect the dots moving back. it's backwards. kind of speculation yeah steve jobs said that you know his, his commencement address and um you know it, that's that's sort of the interesting aspect of life right is you don't know how it's gonna play out you don't know what's gonna be important you know i can do is you know remember as much as you can and and try to you know do your best every moment um because when you look back on it, you will see, you know, the path that you, that got you to where you're at. And yeah. it's, it's weird to... It's a crooked, <laughs> jagged path for me. I'm sure it's weird how crooked too. it is. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's unusually kind of crooked. staggering, drunken. Yeah. <laughs> Get yeah. out there in the end. Yeah. Kind of path. Big time. So, yeah, um, yeah no, it, it's interesting. And so, like, you know, with that in mind, right... When I get offered like new projects or new opportunities right now, it's it's much more like, oh man, this might be something very useful that I can use, you know, a couple of years down the road. And having that mindset of like, all right, so I need to be on my A game. I need to be out there. I need to try this out or try that out. Um, and giving other people yeah. the opportunity to do that too, right? To push it on to other people and say like, hey, I got this project. I think you'd be really good at it. Why don't you take a look at it, take a stab at it, and tell me what you think? You know, and that's and awesome. Pushing that forward is also important, right? Yeah, that's really cool. So I guess I, I'm in a weird position because, um, you know, I, I run the business, and so I don't really always see what it's like to do that within the context of a large organization. And I've worked in a couple, but like not ever one place for too long aside from SKA. And so, like, I guess what's it like? doing that at, at you know Pratt Whitney and like, like pushing to, forward pushing well, forward trying to elevate your team members or like members. seeing an opportunity and pursuing mm -hmm. it because for me it's it's kind of a sales game when I want to see an opportunity and pursue it or if I want to elevate a peer it's it's more of like I see them as being the right person for the job and you know I or maybe they've got you know the persistence to do a thing and we're resource constrained and maybe they're like kind of scrappy so I'll put them in there for that reason or maybe you know they're just senior as fuck and I put them in because I know they can solve it because they've done it dozens of times yeah. it, it sort of depends on the situation and the level of risk aversion and budget but all of it's I mean that's it it's at the end of the day it's based on on risk budget and the perceived you know skill set of that person and, and potential of that person and endurance of that person yeah, so I can I can talk about a couple of aspects of that actually. Um, like all things in life, I got lucky. I got very lucky when Amen I first that. started working at Pratt Whitney. Um, I had a great mentor. I had a couple of probably three or four great mentors. I had too many to count for a lot of reasons, but nice. Um, I had a couple of really great mentors who like got me working on projects, saw potential in me from the start. And, you know, one of the nice things about that job I worked in, or uh, the old team that I was on, was that they had lots of opportunities to work on things, and they were willing to extend to me that trust of, you know, hey, you know, we see that you, you've got some skills here that could help us out. Why don't you take a shot at this and, and see how it goes? And um, I was able to really take advantage of that, and I did really quite well. I brought a lot of value to the company in that regard. 
um, and I got my name out there. And that's that's like you know that's one of those things that they don't teach you in college super well. You know, is <laughs> building that that sort of reputation, right? And yeah, reputation for sure. is everything, man. It's it's a, it's such a big component. Yeah, and you think it's a cliche when you're young and in college because old folks say that and you haven't experienced it yet and then you get out there and you're like oh it really is yeah <laughs> it's so important to have a good reputation and and so i i got lucky in that regard my mentors like coached me and they helped me out with that um Same. one of the one of the big things that um i don't want to say i needed help with but one of the things i got really good at at, at the end was um technical communication that was a very, very oh, interesting. powerful tool to have in my tool belt. You're very good at this, by the way. Like, you helped me get that nerd night talk that I haven't <laughs> given yet, so we won't spoil what it is ready. Because I it's, got sick. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> but, it's a real skill. And, yeah, and you, you gave I, really, really good presentation advice. Like, yeah. I got to say, like, you're one of the smarter people I've got that I've come across. I had a lot of opportunities to get better at it. You know, like I said, it because of the way my old team was set up is that I had a lot of opportunity to give presentations to customers, to senior management, to chief engineers, and they gave me awesome feedback. And, and so this is part of that getting lucky thing is they weren't afraid to tell me what I did wrong. Yeah, it sounds like they heckled you. Oh, and, I mean, they, they, like I said, they, <laughs> they're awesome people and they're very nice and they're super smart. But the biggest thing is that they were honest you know it, yeah i could i could kiss some of the people that gave me harsh criticism yeah you know it, it, i mean at the time it feels like torture but then later you're like i am better for it's, having experienced this and, and that's and you part come of out the, the other side and you get a recommendation from one of those people and you feel like a god you're like How, really okay <laughs> thanks that's part you know of they wouldn't give it it's yeah. part of good mentorship is is to be honest with people you know to tell them you don't want to be you know, unusually harsh or like, you know, severely critical, but to be honest, to say like, Hey, look, you know, you, you, you put this together and I see that you've got like the right stuff here, you know, let's take it to the next level. Let's see what, you know, if you touch this up and you touch that up, here's why this is important. Somebody who's patient and willing to walk you through the steps is, is such a great benefit to the community. Right. And so whatever community that is, whether it's, you know, society, whether it's the engineering firm you're working at, whether it's, you know, your, your whatever company you're working at, it's uh, people who are patient and willing to teach are so. It's just worth awesome that you could find that within the context of, of, you know, like an organization that you're working at. Because for me to find mentors, I always had to sort of look around to different companies and different places and and just meet those people independently and i'm sure you did too to some extent i mean if you were able to endear those folks to you at work you know, it's it's the same thing it's just a different search radius yeah, so. yeah. no they are they they're super cool people and and you learn a lot and and so so technical communication ends up being one of these things that you know we certainly had a class on it at michigan and, and even at michigan i i knew it was important not not like it ended up being in real life right once you once you get out of industry you know having that skill set to put together a really good concise presentation or even just to write good documentation about something is 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 unusually valuable to oh, an engineer right to, to a technical person who you know ostensibly you become an engineer to solve math problems and i think by yeah. by happenstance you might do that in industry, but it ends up being the case that you're often just communicating the problem to people. You're, you're talking to people, you're explaining it to people who are not experts on it, who have not had engineering training necessarily either, uh, who still very much need to make decisions that uh, you know affect the flying public, that affect the shareholders, that affect you know coworkers, and um, that communication ability is interestingly valuable. Something that is definitely not always. What's that quote from How to Win Friends and Influence People? I'll pay tenfold. Yeah, <laughs> like a good communicator as uh -huh. opposed to a technical expert. I'm butchering it, but no, that's but, those lines. But that's the that's the right idea. Is the mm -hmm. the ability to explain what you're thinking, and you know, it's it's a. Uh, I'm still surprised to this day how important it actually is, like outside of all of it, because you know you spend four years solving math problems, and all of a sudden <laughs> it's your slideshows that end up winning the day. You know, it's, it, 
not what a, someone at 18 years old necessarily imagines going into engineering, but um, yeah. definitely, uh, yeah, technical communication is very key. It's just fascinating to me as, as like I said, mostly a free, a free agent. I say that kind of tongue in cheek because I, mean, I do work for a firm at the end of the day, but it's just interesting to know that that's still the case within the context of an organization like Pratt Whitney. Because, I mean, it's a big part of my job, but I consider a lot of that to be like account management, like communicating with clients and and peers, but you're still communicating with peers and your clients are executive leadership. And so. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that, you know, that go, that extends far beyond that, too. I mean, when I was interviewing for, for jobs and talking at the, the career fairs and that, right, those that's just another example of where communication comes in, right? And that's that's more sales oriented, honestly. For sure right? it is, you know, yeah, you're selling yourself. Slightly different from technical communication, but still related, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it comes back to that. And, you know, you, <laughs> that happens all throughout life, right? When you're yeah. dating people, dating yeah, is some, sales. some sales in some <laughs> sense, right? It, it, it all falls out that way, um, you know, in yeah. other aspects. So yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. Making friends. Um, yeah, I mean, trying to like be involved in organizations is a lot of sales. I don't know. I my a lot of my job is just sales. Like, but I feel like people are like, I guess, young engineers have this con- concept of sales, and in some cases, older engineers is like a four letter word or somehow like a bad thing. <laughs> and I don't think that should be the case. I've talked about this a little bit on the podcast already, so I'm sorry if you've heard me say this already, but. I feel like there's like some unethical salespeople that give the rest of the salespeople like kind of a bad name. And so I've experienced it like a few times, like when I've tried to buy a house and when I've tried to buy a car, basically is, is when I've come up, and the telemarketers that have called me and tried to sell me lines of credit I don't need and stuff like that. But for the most part, I think sales is, you know, when done correctly is kind of more similar than not to the technical communication where you talk about, you know, the stakeholders and, you know, yeah, stakeholders. I mean, you mentioned the flying public, the shareholders, and I think you mentioned one other stakeholder group like that I couldn't Yeah, kind of like, you know, coworkers, head. right? Yeah. So, so at companies that are not publicly traded and don't deal in flight safety, right? You know, it, you might make decisions that impact your coworkers, right? Yeah. I mean, it, you, you run a company, and if you if you add employees, you know, at that company, and you make a bad business decision, the, your, people lose their jobs. Your employees lose their jobs, you know, and, yeah. and well, I've had to explain that to people on a project before, which is like, look, if we don't deliver on this milestone, none of us are going to have a job tomorrow. <laughs> right. And, and, and people people kind of get it. Like yeah. when you do that, like it, it's a weird backward pep talk, but I, I gave pretty much that same line one time and uh, people rose to the occasion and, and we were able to accomplish a very difficult to achieve goal. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, at least at small companies, I feel like I, I don't have any direct experience with small companies, but I feel like at small companies, it can be more intimate in that way where like, you know, people have, I mean, I think, I like to think that all employees have a vested interest in their company. I'm sure that's not actually true, but <laughs> um, at a small company, you are acutely aware of, you know, the fragility of that company's existence. Oh, yeah. right? So it's, you have a very visceral reaction to the statement like that, where, you know, that the company's about to, you know, suffer a tremendous loss, you feel it, you know, at a small company. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm really proud of, of the way that my team was able to respond to that positively. And, you know, I mean, it's visceral, you're right, but nobody got mad at me. Like people just did what they needed to do and, and achieved the necessary objectives for us to, you know, keep the project on track and keep the job and, and stay employed. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> That's good. Worked out. <laughs> <laughs> All is well. Yep. But, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, for, likewise. No, I'm, I'm fascinated hearing some of the stuff. So what were some of the, I guess, for people listening, maybe this will be interesting, but, like, what are some of the biggest takeaways that you've gotten in terms of giving a presentation or technical communications? Like, what what are some of the, I guess it's, it's shitty for me to ask you to reduce this into some tips and tricks, but... <laughs> If, if you think it's doable, I, I feel like it would be valuable to people. Yeah. I, listening. I mean, it, I know sure, I want to hear. I'm sure it's it's not going to be anything novel. It's it's the uh, know your audience, right? That's that's the first one, right? Who are you presenting to? 
or you're presenting to subject matter experts who who are going to critique you know your your technical prowess so you're presenting to you know a customer who who wants to know how this is going to help them or you're presenting to somebody who has no idea what you're talking about <laughs> and is there to learn something right it's and you've got everything in between and you don't necessarily know 100 percent where your audience is going to fall in those three categories that's you know? true um so is definitely something to be said about doing your homework on the audience um that's <laughs> That's where it's very easy to for even you know LinkedIn's great for that. Yeah, <laughs> the best presenters are going to flop if they give a presentation to the wrong audience. Yeah, it's just that simple. Well, do you ever practice your presentations for multiple audience types? Because like I've, I've got one mentor in particular, and I, I try to do this with multiple people, but I've got one that's really really good at this, and we'll rehearse presentations for like different types of audience. So. We'll go through a, a presentation and then he'll say, okay, now I'm going to you know, act a different way. And then we'll go through it that way. And then I'll say, okay, now I'm going to act a different way. And then we'll go through it that way. And it sort of hardens you against different possibilities so that you're more adaptive, mainly for sales presentations or negotiations is when, when we sort of do that the hardest. But yeah, I think that you know, what you said is absolutely correct. The sales presentations and negotiations are probably... The presentation I have the least experience working on, just because it's it's just not it doesn't fall under my typical job description. But That's for fair. technical communication, you know, technical communication falls a, a fairly consistent. Okay, so you don't have to role play that format. necessarily. No, be, because in technical communication, I don't want to say that it's more truthful than sales. I, I like to think that sales is you know is something that's an honorable, right? You know what you see is what you're getting kind of presentation, yeah. but you know, how you phrase it's very important. In technical communication, phrasing is still important and you're absolutely going to be honest. And when it comes down to how you present it and your, your, your delivery, it, it just comes down to how can I communicate the subject to the person as opposed to, you know, how do I sell this to the person? You just, you, you are stating the facts, right? You're not yeah. embellishing things. And you're certainly not saying things that your slides don't say, you know, three times in 20 point bold face font. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice, consistent animal in that regard, I feel like. Yeah. Um, so definitely audience. Um, your slides and the way you design your slides is also but key. Do you ever that. walk into a presentation where the audience isn't who you thought they were going to be and you had to change on the fly a little bit? Or they're not responding the way you expected them to respond, I guess, is maybe a better way to word that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Um, that's just, <laughs> you know, that that you have to know the audience is, yeah. is how that comes down to. I've absolutely given a presentation for an intended audience, and it has not gone any way the ah, way fuck. I thought it was going to go. And sometimes that's been my fault. Okay, fair enough. Sometimes it's not my fault. And it... It just depends on on so many variables, right? It depends. On, sometimes the audience knows things that you don't. Yeah, now, that's a common one. I, it, not, I don't want to say it's common, but it. it I've Probably seen like it happen with a more than once. Technologically sophisticated audience, yeah. especially. Yeah. Well, you know, when you are a senior engineer and you're working a problem, or if you're communicating to senior management, and you're communicating to senior management who's been in meetings on this all day. Yeah. You know, things change from nine a.m. to 10, 10 a.m. So it's you know, you, you might have out of date information that the presentation was about. And, and that that's true at any company, right? Especially yeah, fast paced, high tech, Silicon Valley type, you know. Well, exposure. that's true with what I do too. I mean, like I've, uh, earlier today, I had an experience with a client where we were talking about a component we thought we needed for a robotic system. And then we found out that the stakeholder that would be using that component was eliminated from the proposed use case. And I'm just like, oh, I guess we're not building that component anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. We were talking about Elon Musk over dinner, right? Yep. We said, you know, Elon Musk all of, sudden, here. <laughs> all of a sudden buys Twitter, right? How do you think the senior management at Twitter felt for their Q4 projections oh, before they read that tweet, right? <laughs> Wait, Elon Musk announced his purchase of Twitter over Twitter? I don't know if he announced it over Twitter, but I just know that whenever he announced it in whatever form, screwed up all the market projections that <laughs> put together. So yeah. that happens so much. It's almost like 
you know, you can't fall in love with your work because it could all be moot. But you also don't want to not do it. Like I've I've worked with and for people who have read that to mean it's just not worth ever making a plan. And I think that's fallacious as well, because if you don't plan, like how are you gonna get ahead of things? So, you don't have a choice. Yeah. You, know, I, you have to. You don't have a choice. I mean yeah. you, you run a company, I'm a I'm a senior engineer at, at the end of the day, right? Well I think you have to plan permutations. Like you have to yep. plan for multiple eventualities and be willing to sort of turn on a dime. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to for me at least. I think it's that, and I think that, you know, you have to understand too, that some presentations you will not succeed at. And you can't go into the presentation with that mindset, but at the end of the day, you do have to respect that I did the best I could with the information I had at that time. I was prepared for the presentation that I intended to give, intended to give, excuse me, and <laughs> it, Sometimes I spent flops. 40 hours prepping for a presentation one time earlier in my career where the person didn't even show up. Like they were in a different state yep. than I was supposed to be presenting to. Yep. Oh, and I yeah. never got to give the presentation. And, you know, it's it's easy to want to kill yourself in that moment. But... Hey, Spencer, it's only gotten worse since we all started working remote. Now people <laughs> just don't show up for the Zoom meeting even though they're in the living room. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. So you're like, ah, I got you right there, dude. You're right there. <laughs> um, it happens like that. And so so presenting skills, right, big thing I would say is you definitely know your audience. You have to have slides built to, you know, match what you're saying. Um, and I, number three, it's got to be simple. You know, in everything that you do, communicating effectively comes down to being able to you know wrap ideas and simple concepts for anyone to understand you will not anyone can confuse the hell out of somebody right <laughs> you could you could make you know how to make cereal how to pour milk into a bowl of cereal as confusing as possible and you can confuse the smartest people on the planet right on yeah. how to do that that's not impressive pronate your wrist 15 degrees <laughs> <laughs> see you just did it right now you know, what was that supinate pronate you know, i don't know which one that is so I, can't remember <laughs> I think pronate's that one something like that yeah but you see my point right is yeah. that it's not impressive to you know confuse somebody. What yeah. is impressive is to simplify something to such an extent that anybody can understand it. Yeah. That takes skill. That's yeah. something that Carl Sagan Einstein. got famous for. <laughs> That's something that Richard Feynman yeah. got famous for. Oh, for, for sure. That's something that Neil deGrasse Tyson is famous for. You know, yeah. that's that. These people are in some sense they they earned respect of society because they're able to reduce complexity. Yeah. They're still able to understand it, and they can yeah. make it more complex as they need to. Yeah. Um, especially if in a presentation, right, you know, somebody is asking a question, they want to know what's actually happening they behind the curtain. start bringing up, like, Greek things for coefficients. And yeah, stuff, you know? exactly. You know, like, All right, let's talk about it. Fine, here's my backup slide on it. You, yeah. know? you were ready for that, right? You had the backup I slide the backup ready to slides. go. You, know? you, you were ready to go, right? This... My backup slide deck typically runs like three times as long as my main deck. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's, a, yeah. that's a feature. That's not a bug. Right, that's yeah. that's uh, the hallmark of a well-prepared presentation. Like you yeah. anticipate the questions of the audience before they come up, and then you cut out the superfluous shit so you don't bore ninety percent of the people. One hundred percent. Yep. Because <laughs> you want right. That's it. You know, if you're presenting, you know, allegedly there's a start time and an end time. This presentation with some room for questions. Allegedly, you know, <laughs> allegedly, we've all been in meetings where that premise is violated. You know. Yeah, there's certain meetings where I will like I'll schedule buffer time at the end because I know it's going to run long, and it, it, yeah, it's when you meet with certain people, a certain yeah, I think you know the ones I'm talking about. Like you know when they're gonna yeah, you can predict. And that's that's uh, that's life. You know, yeah. you're not not everybody is is going to be as adept as yeah. starting and well, ending. Well, there's certain people where I'll them. apply a multiplier to their estimate for timeline on a project, and I have multipliers I'll develop. You know. And for certain people as a project manager where I'm like any new grad fresh out of school gets a two to three X multiplier on their time estimates and automatically usually a three X if they're if they're brand new and I've never worked with them before you know and then over time people's multipliers sort of converge on you know I, I sort of figure out like okay if so and so and then I apply that to my own time estimates where I try to dial them in as close to one as I can get them 
Because I'm like, okay, I thought it was going to take this long. It actually took that long. I should adjust my multiplier and, you know, dial in the control loop. <laughs> so. We've all been to weddings where somebody gets a microphone that probably should never have been handed the microphone in the first place. <laughs> you know, we've all been there before. Those people have jobs. And sometimes you end up working with them. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great way to put it's it. It's just how it goes. Yeah. But... Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> All right, so keep it simple. Know your audience. Yeah, and um, then, and part of the keeping it simple. Slides. Part of the keeping it simple too comes from, you know, you also have to understand what you're doing. Yeah, you, know, you if you're a subject matter expert, somebody who knows their stuff, right? Somebody who's ready to go uh, for that presentation. That implies that you understand it well enough to simplify it. And there's well, you probably spent some time it. simplifying it too. Like I, I know for me, I don't always converge on like a simple deck right away. Like it takes a little bit of crunching on to, you know, sort of figure it out and, and reduce it to less parts, as it were. Yep. Yes. It, you. You. Uh, a good slideshow is created by reducing a very long slideshow to the key pieces. Brevity is the soul of wit. Yeah, brevity is the soul of wit. You took the words right out of my mouth. Nope. <laughs> yep, it is. Yeah. Feynman, by the way, was one of my heroes growing up. Like I, I When I read Shirley or Joking Mr. Feynman in high school, I felt like I wasn't so alone in the world. <laughs> I'm sure we all did. <laughs> Richard Feynman was instrumental in finding the root cause of the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. I remember that. That's in uh, What Do You Care What Other People Think? Which Congress. Is one of other books. You, you know, special summoned him or put him on that, that investigation team or somehow he got involved and put together the review for all that, you know, the, the, the physics behind that and explaining it to Congress, you know, yeah. famously not rocket science Congress. Yeah, when he he scratched his head over that for a long time. I mean, he, he surveyed a lot of people. I mean, he, I think, well, he had that famous demonstration where he took, like, some of the O-ring material and stuck it in a glass of ice water and then pulled it out, and it just didn't go back right away. And he did that during, I think it was during a meeting with Congress, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And he just showed it rather than talking because, you know, he knew people weren't going to listen as much as they were just going, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. But that's, uh, you know, that's that's how it is. Um, and, and, you know, he's remembered for that. The fact we're talking about it right now is, yep. is, Both an, of indicator, us heard that story. is an indicator <laughs> of how effective it was. You know? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, that's something that I think as engineers we, you know, we're always in this battle of, well, about complexity, right? It, it, computer science, right, in programming, they spend a lot of time writing clean and concise programs. Yeah. And, you know, anyone who's ever programmed before has written spaghetti code. You know, it's, it's part the of the experience. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody does it. And the people... Or if you're trying to hack something together, like, really... <laughs> you yeah. hope you don't. But... That's true. We've all been in the sandbox, but... Yeah. Um, you know, when you just you, get a crazy deadline and you got to do some sinful shit just to hit your objectives. Prototype piece of shit, you know, yeah, just got to yeah. get across the finish Ship line. Ship it. Ship it. Yeah, it works. And, you know, we'll fix we'll it clean later. We'll clean it up later. Yeah. Uh, but the, the best programmers are the one who write the most readable code, you know, and, and it's the people who write the simplest to understand code. Those are the ones who are really yeah, good programming. Yeah, 70 layers of recursion or whatever isn't going to help you if nobody understands how nobody to Nobody writes it. recursion in the real world yep. for a reason, right? That's yeah. because nobody wants well, to just take the time to understand And it. it's memory intensive. Like, there's, there's a bunch of reasons not to. Yeah. Because you have to create all these frames now to run your stupid fucking... Yeah, if you yeah. don't use tail recursion... Yes, absolutely. What is tail recursion? Tail recursion is a, a computer science trick where the computer, when it compiles code into machine language, or, you know, it, it, I think Python is trying to do this in an interpreted world. Um, I mean, Java does the same thing, I'm pretty sure. What it does is if, if you write your program's recursion in such a way, it will actually reuse the stack frame instead of creating a new one. Oh, interesting. On top of it. So it's smart enough to say, hey, the parameters are not changing in each instance. You know, we'll the stack the overflow. Stack what it is, is it lets you write a recursive algorithm 
with none of the space issues of recursion. Oh, okay, that's pretty clever. And yeah, but why would you? Re- I mean, it's overly complicated in some cases. You know, it's, it's all right. Iterative <laughs> algorithms are easier to understand, and people don't use tail recursive algorithms. You know, all the all over the place for a reason. It's because it's not as easy to understand. And, yep. and and so that's where that comes from, right? But makes sense. That's that's the gist of it. So you know, you want to be concise with what you say, and and programming is a great you know, environment to showcase that, right? The best programmers write the easiest to read code. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So, yeah, definitely want to be concise on the presentations. And um, yeah, those would probably be the top three things, I'd say. Uh, Use PowerPoint, don't use Google Slides. I use Google Slides all the time. I know you use Google Slides. So I just want to throw that in there. <laughs> Cut this out later if yeah, you want. you've seen my, no, 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 it's all right. We can, we can debate this. I have been using Microsoft lately at work. Um, so, well, I don't know. I, I, I like things about Google and I like things about Microsoft. Like what I like about Microsoft is that they don't have a way to get at all of your data. <laughs> like about <on> Google <laughs> is that it seems to be more stable for collaboration. What I like about Microsoft is it seems to have like a better functionality set. Like, and also more stability in the files, you know, assuming that you saved it and it didn't push an update while you were trying to save it or auto save wasn't turned off. <laughs> what I like about Google yeah. is that you don't have to worry about auto save no. being turned on. And, you know, so long as you don't suffer a data integrity issue in one of Google's data centers, which has happened to me, I wrote a um, 30 page article one time that Google just lost. And I was questioning my sanity and I didn't think it happened until I was finally able to find a link to it. I sent to a colleague in an email that was a broken link. And I was like, okay, I didn't imagine writing that. (laughs) It's a real thing. (laughs) (laughs) Just that happened. The stuff of nightmares. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a good exercise in stoicism because I had an opportunity to write it again better the next time. And so I, I don't know, I try to think about it that way when I, when I suffer something like, I mean, I try not to lose data in the first place, but when it happens, um, as it sometimes does, you know, in spite of your best efforts to the contrary, um, I don't know. I feel like it's just important to, you know, have a mentality of, you know, how am I going to learn from this and how am I going to move past this? Cause you know, I'm not going to let it hold me down. Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> I've certainly lost documents before, and it's it's infuriating, right? Yeah. We're in, in 2022. It definitely it, sucks ass. Yeah, computer I mean. still eats my PowerPoint for some reason. You know it, that shouldn't happen, but it does. Yeah. And you know it it that's it, sometimes you can't avoid it, but the recovery features are have gotten better. They're not perfect. Sometimes you have to manually recover the recovery feature. You know, I've noticed. Yeah. Well, Google has that too, where you can dig back in and look at all the deltas hypothetically in your document. Right. And go back in and like go to a point in time. It doesn't always work, but. No, it doesn't. And sometimes you have to go into like the Windows temporary folder and find the recovery <laughs> file, and copy paste it manually. It's, it's, it's good that mess. you know those hacks. It, it, yeah. You I wish I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I didn't have to, but you know. Do you ever, do you ever like fork off? So one of my coworkers recently has been advocating for this, which is, you know, and he, he preaches this to, to the entire team, which is, you know, like from time to time, just save a copy of your work. And so maybe like a few times a week, we just fork off a copy and, and put it in an archive directory uh, when working with Microsoft products in particular. And it seems to offer some protection there. Um, um I've, I've definitely done that. Yeah. Uh, especially with the ones that I spent lots and lots of time on. Um, yeah, because you'd hate to lose it all because of data corruption. Yeah. It's happened on the podcast. I recorded an episode with uh, Dr. Ken Urish, who's an orthopedic surgeon um, who works with like medical robots. And he's, he's an interesting dude. He's hilarious. Um, he, he did like an increment impression into the mic when he was in here. <laughs> <laughs> but I recorded an entire episode with him. And he, he did it, like, with his phones. I think he was sending it to, like, a buddy or his wife or someone. And so, like, um, he, uh, I had to call him up and tell him, like, this is a guy that, like, came from doing surgeries to record a podcast. And, you know, 
I, I called him up and I'm like, uh, we suffered an audio interface failure and I don't have audio on all but 10 minutes of that podcast. And he was like, oh, I guess we'll do it better next time. <laughs> like he, he had such a good attitude about it. <laughs> I don't think I've ever talked about that on here, but that's what happened. <laughs> so, I, I was so embarrassed. I was probably beat red when I made that phone call. Yeah. And I mean that, you know, but that stuff happens and I, I it's probably great to save backups of anything you do. You know, I, yeah. I, I always upload to, you know, we have a backup whole backup server, computer. But... Like there's two right. computers under this desk. One's there and one's there. And that one has a separate audio interface card because of what happened with Dr. Yarish. So I guess what, why do you, why, why aerospace engineering? Like why did, why did you go in that direction? Good question. Um, and this is encompassing of controls of yeah. you know fluid dynamics of all of it. Like why why want to work on aircraft, spacecraft, and any of that stuff? Well, I mean aside from the fact that it's badass. Yeah, it it's really uh, it's not as satisfying as you might think. It's I knew I wanted to do some kind of engineering. Um, well, I, I applied to the College of Engineering, and I I enjoyed it enough that I knew I was going to stay in engineering. It was just a matter of which department was I going to go for. And I I spent a lot of time looking at naval engineering. Oh, interesting. Um, naval the naval architecture marine engineering building is right there, and I liked it. And I thought about doing it. It's a very small department. It's, it was only there's not that many people there, um, and I don't even know what the industry is like for it anymore these days. But I don't remember it being super big. Interesting. At least not on the Michigan campus. I'm sure it is elsewhere. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of looked at Naval and I was like, oh, this, this is interesting stuff. And, and I looked at um, mechanical engineering. I looked at aerospace engineering. Uh, I knew I didn't want to do just computer science. A lot of the reason why I picked aerospace engineering is because it had the least downsides, I think is the way I would put it, right? It's It's... It's something that's unique, interesting, engineering related, and not you know just computer programming, but still has oh. a, a decent amount of computer programming in it just by definition, right? To be honest, that's kind of what got me into robotics myself. I mean, I started undergrad as engineering undecided, and I sort of flip-flop between mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and computer science. I ended up getting a degree in computer science but I always was in the machine shop during time off, and I, I kind of found a second home at the Carnegie Mellon University Robotics Club when I was a University of Pittsburgh student. And um, that's, I think that's what kind of got me interested was the fact that you could, you're not just doing one thing. Like you, you really have to have an understanding of, at least in robotics, mechanical, electrical, and software to be any good at it. And so, and obviously systems engineering kind of comes with that because that's what ties it all together but that's yeah i think it's a similar motivation yeah it, interesting. It, it the biggest thing for me you know the advice i had gotten when i first went to college was pick something that you know you can graduate on time with that's that's the that's different to start right Who told you, know, you that uh if it wasn't a parent it was a friend of a parent. Hilarious. <laughs> you know, so somebody told me that, and I obviously graduated on time, thank God. So, you know, that... I did not. That was important, <laughs> um, and it worked out for me. Like, you know, like I said earlier, I got lucky, right? You know, not everybody has that experience. Not everybody's that lucky. Yeah, well, I also I took on lucky. two majors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got lucky with it, and not everybody has that experience, but I did. And so I found something that I could, I knew reasonably I could graduate with in four years time. And I was like, that's good enough. We'll start with that and just see how it goes. And, and, you know, I ended up really enjoying it by the end of it. Um, you know, it's one of those things where like looking back on it, it made sense. But at the time when I was picking, I had no idea that was going to be, I had no idea that was going to be it. And that's just how it fell out. Um, there were lots of interesting ones too. Like there's climate and space science. That one was kind of neat for a while. But what does that, that mean exactly? Climate and space. Is that like setting up a climate on another planet? Yeah, it's, it'd be like meteorology, but also, you know, emphasis on the study of like exo atmosphere and other planets, atmospheres and, you know, space in general. That's really cool. Yeah. Just climate science, not necessarily earth centered, right? That, that'd yeah. be the way to, the best way to describe it. 
Space robots have always been fascinating to me. I've yeah. not worked on one personally yet, but the people I know that have done that, and I mean, I, I, I'm hearing enough things just from being around people that do it to sort of start to absorb some of the, the things from like a 30,000 foot view. And it's, it's just seems like a fun thing to work on. Like extreme environments in general are interesting. Like making things to survive like a lunar night, for instance, is, <laughs> is interesting. Yeah, I think it's like that negative and, over 130 centigrade. I think you're yep. dealing with yeah. It the environments so. are wacky. The uh, the propulsion systems are wacky. I my junior year, summer after my junior year, I did a research internship at the uh, the Hall Thruster Lab. What's and the I, Hall Thruster Lab? A Hall Thruster is a a it's a advanced form of propulsion for space that ejects a uh, a gas at very high velocity out the back using magnetic and electric fields. Weird. It's just a very, very low thrust, long burn propulsion system. And it's designed How do you get to gas to go with magnetic and electric fields. Plasma. It's 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 converted to a pla they use plasma to, to accelerate the gas out. That's interesting. And um, I worked in that lab, I did an internship there working on of all things lab view. And I, I wrote yeah, like a lot of advanced lab view, lab view VIs for that, and that that was it was interesting <clears throat> in of itself. But I I really enjoyed like mostly just learning about the lab in general because it's a giant vacuum chamber, and that's cool. You know, it's massive, and they were testing these advanced thrusters that one day are you know allegedly going to propel robots in space to really far distances because it's a very cool. it's a We'll call it an efficient form of propulsion without getting into the specifics. It's yeah. very, very high efficiency and could probably get us, you know, much further in the solar system, you know, once it's all worked out. That's once pretty they, awesome. They work through the physics of it. Yeah. Yeah. So space robots are neat. Um, and that's something that, you know, if you're interested in it, there's, there's definitely a market segment for it, probably growing by yeah, the way. Yeah, but I feel like those people are, are like, I don't know. I'm not specialized enough in that to be competitive in that market. Like, I mean, I've I've done work that I'm proud of in medical, in you know prosthetics, um, in you know construction robots, in inspection robots, in inspection uh, aquatic inspection robots, as well as um, I don't know. I've done a lot of work I'm proud of in different areas, but I feel like space is. Like, I don't know. I don't know if they're looking for people like me. I feel like they want, like, someone that's just made space robots their whole career to work in that field. Like, there seems, it seems to be kind of a good old boys club in that way. It might be. Um, it's tough to say, right? You know, if, if, you, if you never try, you never know. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, for sure. Now, I, I do think that the challenges facing robots in space are definitely unique, right? There's some interesting concerns <laughs> with radiation that exists out there that you don't have to deal with on this planet up this at the surface anyways. Yep. Um, so that seems know. to be kind of a killer. Do you get that with high altitude um, craft that don't go into space? Like, or I guess what's considered space? Like how high up do you have to be before you're in space as it were? Oh, I just know that anecdotally, if you fly on an airplane, you do get elevated levels of radiation exposure. Yeah. Um, nothing that we studied in college for. Um, yeah. If you fly high enough, certainly low Earth orbit, radiation becomes a bigger concern. <laughs> yeah. And if you leave the planet altogether, yeah, it's it's uh you know you you leave the was it the Van Allen radiation belts you have to pass through that. Um, it's constant exposure to the sun. Um, that's that's up there too. That's interesting. Yeah, there's interesting effects with radiation at that altitude, but uh, yeah, like it seems like the high altitude satellites are way more hard than the low altitude satellites. Yeah, against, against radiation in particular. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's radiation. There's uh, you know, depending on what your mission is, you know, you have to store all that propellant somewhere, and you know, longevity of the robot's existence, right? How are you gonna charge the batteries? The solar panels or like they use um, radio generators, radio isotope generators on those. What's a radio isotope generator? Um, it's at a high level. It's it's a fuel cell. These are you know some kind of radioactive material. Interesting. Um, so they, they'll use that to power the spacecraft if they can't get solar panels on it for like low amounts of power. 
How long will that last you typically? Um, I'm not sure. I couldn't tell you off the top of yeah, my no head. I'd have to look it serious. up. But you know, I, those kinds of things are interesting for space robots. You can't have radioactive robots on the ground, but you can in no, space. No, that would be you know, kind and, of a kind <laughs> of a mess. Yeah, have fun talking to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about that. But yeah. uh, in space, is it just less regulated once you leave? Well, I mean, I'm sure you still have to deal with the NRC to even deal with that shit. To get it off the planet, yeah. And then it just becomes deregulated. If you have a radioactive space satellite that's leaving the Earth, it's not as big of a deal, right? Yeah, I guess that makes sense. If you're orbiting Jupiter, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a radioactive generator, right? It's just, uh, (laughs) (laughs) you you can, you know, push the leverage a little bit further than you can in atmosphere. Uh, Yeah, it makes sense. So, so which means it, you don't need as much shielding material, which means your power to weight ratio can be greater. Yeah. Yeah. There's utility in that. Um, certainly there's people that specialize in that too, right? You know, you can get a whole PhD in, uh, you know, designing those things. Uh, yeah, for, for sure. Spacecraft, which, uh, you know, you'd never get to do for, you know, your robotics firm here on, on this planet. But yeah. Uh, well, there's robotics yeah. firms that just specialize in space. I mean, I wasn't... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Trying to be intentionally so I mean, I just oh, mean yeah, there exists special. Like I interviewed Eddie Tunstall, who's the CTO of Motive Space Systems in Pasadena. Okay. An incredibly smart guy. Um, but I mean, he's been building space robots since the '80s. I guess there are people at SKA that have worked on space robots too. I mean, like my coworkers, not me. But yeah. there's there's a few people on the team that have worked for like Northrop Grumman, NASA, um, other space companies. Um, I won't mention by name. But yeah, I mean, there's there's a bunch of them. People I met at SpaceX when I worked there that now you know come and work on SKA projects from time to time. Mm-hmm. And so I guess I mean probably as a team I could I could raise some competitive people to work in that industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I I wouldn't put it past you. You're a great salesman. I have no doubt that you could yeah. sell this to a whole bunch of engineers, you know, to put together for yeah. sure. But I mean, if I did that, I, I, I would have to shut up and listen because I fully acknowledge I'm not like a subject matter expert on that yet. Yeah. And so no doubt. I mean, it's a it's an interesting science, right? There's a reason that space science is separate from the you know the, the other disciplines and departments. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, Michigan it, was adding a robotics facility that when I when I graduated, they had a whole another building just dedicated to robots. You know, oh, that's pretty robotics cool. Not many universities. Did that when I was an undergrad. Um, when did you graduate? Your I got my graduate degree in 2019. Nice. I got mine in 2014. Okay. And not many universities had a robotics program back then. I remember, like, one of the reasons I only applied to Carnegie Mellon for grad school is because it was the only school that had a robotics program I wanted to go to at the time. <laughs> so. But that's. But a, I mean, that's that's a testament to what you said. You were like, oh, in 2019, Michigan was just adding yeah. a robotics building. I mean, MIT has Lincoln Labs, CMU has NREC, and I mean, I don't know. There's Stanford probably has a version of that, but like, yeah, yeah, no doubt. not that many. No doubt. Yeah. Um, robotics is a is a great place to be these days. You know, it, it's only going to become bigger. Has right? the grass lab. Yeah, more yeah. Uh, more automation comes online and. Yeah, you know, it's I, interesting seeing where the hot spots are in robotics because automation, industrial automation, has been around in some form since the 1960s, which isn't to say it's not advanced and interesting. Like, I mean, I think growing up, you know, um, working in the field robotics center and just being sort of predominantly interested in field robotics over industrial automation, it's easy to sort of poo poo it and just be like, ah, everyone does that. That's a. But then when you see some really impressive industrial automation setups and you go to some factories, as I'm sure you have, um, you start to see, you know, like thousands of robots working in concert or, you know, one really, really massive robot doing something incredibly interesting that's maybe like five stories high. Or, you know, I mean, I'm trying to think of some of the other things I've seen, you know, over the years that have impressed me. Um, I mean, even going down to like smaller scale machines, I mean, I saw one that existed. I'm trying to think what I can say without getting anyone in trouble. Um, it was uh, manufacturing a uh, high volume medical good. So it was doing, um, it was making a medical consumable that was, you know, probably tens of millions of units through the life of the machine. 
and it was a multi-million dollar machine and it was all custom and some of the things they were doing to do this were really really interesting um i mean i don't know there's some incredibly smart people that just specialize in that so it's it's just interesting to know like how far the breadth of human knowledge goes and you know <laughs> I don't know, just to kind of get philosophical for a moment. The fact that, you know, you can choose to do that with field robotics, you can do it with space robots, you can do it with, you know, jet engines. Yeah, well, drones, right? Drones yeah. were the big thing when I went, you know, in the last five to ten years, right? The, uh, obviously, the quadcopter drones oh, yeah. and all those have been a huge hit, both amongst kids and adults, I might add. Yeah, um, I still haven't bought one yet, but I feel like I followed William Light to the party in that regard. Yeah, the, the quadcopters are fun, but you know, I've the, given away like four of them at trade shows. You can <laughs> actually go to a drone fireworks show, right? You know, I've they, been. I was actually talking about this at work today too. Yeah, they've replaced yeah. the drone, the, the fireworks with concerted, you know, drones with lights. And... Apparently, the battery charging is a big challenge in that. So that's like one of the things that makes it challenging to do that kind of show. Sure. Because they have to cycle out constantly. You get like a 30 minute runtime, I guess, last I checked. And so, I mean, there's ways to make docks that they land on and charge on. Um, but some of the stuff people do with those is really interesting. Like there was a Burning Man video I meant to watch before the end of the day, which is <laughs> apparently really interesting drone sculptures. <laughs> so. I mean, I think the SpaceX is probably the ultimate example of the, the drone oh. you know, application, right? In some yeah. sense, the Falcon rocket is just a... a well, and now the... the what's it called? Drone. <laughs> yeah, with the Raptor and the Starship. Huh? Yeah, you're right. I mean, and well, I mean, there's... Like, Lockheed Martin was making expensive drones, like, in the 70s and 80s, right? Yes, I mean, they were. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So. Kelly Johnson's, uh, you know, whole Skunk Works, right? They, they came up with the... It was a D twenty one, I think it was the the drone that was launched out the back of the SR seventy one Blackbird or the that A12. was launched out of the back of the SR seventy one. Might have been the A twelve interceptor, but it was one of those CIA projects. You know, it, can we build a? It dropped like a bunch of microfilm, right? Like in the yeah. ocean somewhere. Uh, <laughs> it's such they a, never had a success so, with it, but yeah. they they realized that sending a person over, you know, a country was going to be a losing battle with in terms of surface to air missiles. And yeah. so eventually they the said... The Russian SAMs were getting really good then, right? Yep. So yeah. they said, we're just going to send the drone, the computer. Right? We lose the computer. Don't have to do a prisoner exchange like Gary Powers, right? You know, so <laughs> um, that was the motivation for that. And so they, they came up with this drone that might be able to do the job. And I don't think it ever succeeded that they have made us aware of. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe it did, and it, you know, they just can't talk about it, but, you know. Yeah, it makes sense. I don't know, but yeah, they, they've been experimenting with drones like that since forever. I mean, hypersonic stuff, you know, the, the recent hypersonic developments in terms of those, those, uh... Could you fly that manned, even with those type of forces? I mean... Well, the new Top Gun movie would have you believe that, but, uh... <laughs> I didn't watch it yet. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's going to be a challenge, right? It's hard enough to make something fly at Mach 7. Now you want to keep a person alive and fly at Mach 7. <laughs> um, that's hard. I, my master's thesis was on, a, on scramjets, on hypersonic missile-type scramjets. Were you one of the ones that talked about this? You might have brought up the, like, the surface of the aircraft wants to get really hot, and that's, a, that's an obstacle? Yes. Okay. Yep. There's, a, there's a paper that was published on that called... It's, it's a cute name, you know, when you think about it, it's called The Problem of Aerodynamic Heating. <laughs> a very famous paper in, the, in that hypersonic, you know, academic world where it just basically says that over Mach 5, things get very hot. And, um, you know, that, that's what, it's a challenge from a material science perspective, right? It, it, the technology is limited by our ability to transfer heat without losing the craft. And <laughs> what kind of materials do we have that can even deal with that? I mean, the SR-71 was made out of titanium, and that only flew at Mach 3. A measly Mach 3.2, right? And yeah. Now you're talking about flying at Mach Hypersonic is Mach 7 or faster? This is a, this is a controversial okay. subject. I'm just throwing <laughs> that out there. So for anyone listening, <laughs> so right, you know, I understand. Anything over Mach 3 could probably be considered hypersonic. Interesting. From okay. an academic perspective. You could also make the same argument that anything less than Mach 7 doesn't count. So 
really it just depends who you're asking and why okay and it, yeah it makes sense things get hot past mach 2 yeah they get really hot the faster you rockets go. go faster than that but the lack of atmosphere allows them to do so yeah okay yeah that makes absolutely sense. and and you know the fact that it's shaped like a fucking pencil. <laughs> the higher you go, the faster you're flying anyways in Mach number space. Which means the lower the atmosphere that you're up against. Right. So you can fly at Mach 25, you know, very high up. But you'll never be able to fly at Mach 25 at sea level. Okay. You won't be able to fly at Mach 25 at sea level for very long. <laughs> Is the way that ends up falling out. <laughs> that makes sense. A little tongue-in-cheek. Yeah, for sure. I, um, I see what you did there. The yeah, so that's that's the challenge with that. So they, you know, the the Air Force or maybe the Navy. I know they they worked with NASA to get something up to Mach seven in the nineties at sea level. No, like sixty thousand feet okay. high altitude. They tried a couple times. They tried in the nineties, and I think they tried again in the twenty tens or two thousands. And to my knowledge, they couldn't get it to work. There were some papers. So that's kind of the cheat, is that you just go up into the outer atmosphere or it into is. orbit, and that's how you're able to... Yeah, and yeah. you know, for the Air Force, right, or the CIA, your mission is reconnaissance at that altitude. You can, you know, yeah. take pictures. Yeah. Really cool pictures. But um, if you want a missile, like Russia and China say they want, you have to get to sea level at some point. Well, yeah, but I mean, when you come back down, is that like an ICBM? Yeah. Don't they sort of do that, or is that they do? But I don't even know. I don't know how fast they fly. But okay, that's interesting. That being fair, you know, that all things fair, right? That I, I know they fly fast-ish, but yeah. I don't know if they fly at the same rate that a hypersonic missile would. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. they might fly slower. At different I wonder how fast like the V two went. Just to like think of the first one that like sort of did this. That's a good question. Yeah. I, 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 I could. I try not to Wikipedia that. stuff in here because I don't want to be like on the computer during the podcast. <laughs> Maybe I'll look that up later. I'm curious now. You know, they flew fast enough. Yeah, and nothing, that was all that mattered. Nobody could counter it at the time. Yeah. At the time, I'm sure now you could. And supersonic aerodynamics, we understood the math for how to do it, but we didn't necessarily have the craft to do it right until after World War II. That's yeah. when the sound barrier started to get broken. Like the Bell X one, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, and they had the the control surface problem, right? The the control surfaces they they couldn't control the craft once they broke the sound barrier. They had to redesign the actuators. Wait, there. how did that work? Like, what was the what was the issue when you broke the sound barrier with controls? On a standard airplane, the control surface has a little slit at the back that goes up and down. Yeah. For a supersonic aircraft, they switched to just an all-moving surface. So they stopped attaching the, the elevator or the ailerons, right? They just had, a, I think it's still used ailerons, but the elevator at the back was all moving. That was a secret. When you say all moving, what do you mean? So typically, it's a flat piece of metal, and then there's a little tiny flap at the back that okay. moves up and down. Okay, this one, helps. the whole thing moves up and down. Oh, I see. Okay. And That's that was required to get supersonic control. And that just was something that you didn't tell anyone about because that would yeah, that's and it what was top secret, to do you know, because because you know we figured it out and we didn't want the Russians or the Soviet Union to figure it out. And so How did we they kept it a secret? Like, we kept it a secret. Because they wanted... eventually got supersonic too. Yeah, it was an interesting story. I'd have to look it up after this, but I want to say that someone took a picture of it that wasn't supposed to take a picture. Ah, of it. that's how it always seems to get. Can't, can't remember if that if it was that. That's um, how they got the atomic bomb too. Yeah, I can't remember if it was that one in particular, but I think it was almost leaked to the press for a picture. If I remember oh, right. wild! So they got through the New York Times or something. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> All it takes is one picture, right? Why yeah. is the, why is that whole thing moving? You know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, interesting. Ah, uh, it, it looked like the whole thing was there before. Wild. Yeah, yeah, that's that's quite wild. Okay, so you talked about earlier, um, when we mentioned controls, you mentioned, I can't remember what you called it, but you were talking about like a rocket where it's being depleted of fuel and so the center of mass is changing. Yeah. So a solid rocket in particular, I think. Controls engineering is, is neat like that. There's so many different uh, types of Situations systems. you yeah. find yourself in. Yeah, you've got dynamic versus static systems. You've got time invariant versus time varying systems. What's linear time and non invariant versus time invariant? Time invariant means that the system stays same 
if you shift the time and, and so on, right? What that so that's means, what we were talking about with the rocket engine. For yeah, instance. and it, there's probably a more clear, and concise example to throw back to what we talked about earlier. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's a system that's changing over time. Right, and and I think that uh, I think that's one of the appeals of that controls. Would be time invariant. Time invariant. Yeah, I. I'm going to butcher this explanation. No, right? Right? <laughs> Some, somebody's going to call me out on this in the comments if I, if I try to explain it over here. But the, the way to think of it is that a time invariant system is easy to control or easier to control. It stays the same over time. Yeah, and a linear system, of course, is easier than a nonlinear system to control. What does a nonlinear system refer to? This is where my log yeah. understanding kind of falls. I'm not good at math. That's, if you haven't figured this out, Mike. What, like I said, computers are very good at solving yeah. linear systems. Like not I was good. good at math through like half of undergrad, and then I became not good at math when I started coming up against no people judgment. better at math than me. <laughs> Absolutely no judgment. Linear systems are easy for computers to solve. Like we talked about earlier. Nonlinear systems are hard. And sometimes we might not have found a solution to a nonlinear system. Yeah. Um, so it's a challenge from a controls perspective of how do you, how do you solve that. So to give you an example, right? Your car's cruise control is very easy for a computer to figure out, right? Gas right. pedal makes car go. I thought that the relationship between... Hmm, interesting. I thought the relationship between like fuel consumption and um, RPMs was cubic, but maybe I'm wrong in that. Um, just think of it from the controls perspective. Okay, right? well, it's the, pretty easy the, to control you know, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you apply more torque, you okay. get faster car maybe and i took gas too literally there sorry <laughs> if you're trying to if you're trying to control to a, your cruise control limit you know that system is is very easy to set up if you're yeah, trying relatively to simple if you're trying to do something really wacky like you know aim a satellite at the sun or away from the sun you know that might be a tougher one you know you've got to do transfers <laughs> between planets you know that that kind of thing that might be uh that might be trickier to oh, figure that's, out that's really interesting right? you know it's uh the linear and nonlinear refers to the system that describes the physics of the of the the craft, right? So it almost sounds like your model changes at some inflection point. Yeah, and and we we have tricks to try to come up, try to solve these models, right? You can linearize the system. That's a common trick in mathematics um, that you can leverage. Some systems, you know respond linearly for a very narrow set of conditions and then as soon as you deviate from that you're in trouble it's linearized within those parameters and the perfect example of that is an airplane yeah. autopilot interesting okay, airplanes are very easy to control in cruise conditions right steady level flight airplane responds beautifully to linear type inputs if you stall, <laughs> there is no autopilot to control you at that point. There, the, the math is not linear, or it does not respond linearly to your inputs. And so a great that's example of a nonlinear system is an airplane that's in a, what do they call it? An airplane that has deviated from controlled flight. Deviated from controlled that's flight. That's the politically correct it's way of euphemism. saying stall. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, that would be an example of a good, you know, difficult to control system. Now, deviated from control. There's probably I'm not an autopilot guy. Yeah. There's probably a good amount of money you could make if you came up with an autopilot that worked in stall conditions. But interesting. They might have that on the military side. I wouldn't know. Um, it, it probably exists. I would think if it's a target, it right? Like I know that in the commercial side, one of the first things that pilots learn in flight school is to shut off the autopilot when anything goes wrong. <laughs> and that tells you everything you need to know about the civilian market for playing autopilots, right? <laughs> There's a reason they say to do that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so, yeah, that's that's an example in control. There's a famous study of an Airbus, right, where that, that happened, where it went into a stall condition and people kept it in autopilot and just stalled out and crashed into the ocean, I thought. Probably. Um, yeah, I... That falls under that interesting category of, you know, airplanes that uh, are designed to keep people safe. So safe that sometimes the systems themselves are dangerous. And we've seen that with Boeing, right? Uh, Boeing's system. Boeing, the reason the Boeing 737 MAX had an issue is because the safety system was malfunctioning. Oh, that's interesting. Among other things. There's a, there's a whole 
re whole host of reasons why that's the case, but at a very surface level, yeah, that it can be described like that. And that's a, that describes a relationship between technology and humans that, you know, is probably more philosophical than you want to get into right nah, now. Nah, I can but, talk philosophy, know. but I mean, it sounds like what it comes yeah. down to is if you over trust in automation for cases the automation wasn't designed for, that's when your Tesla is going to crash into Absolutely. <laughs> the barrier of Highway 1 or whatever happened recently. Tesla is another great example yeah. of a self-driving car. Um, no doubt there are robots, there are famous examples in robotics of, of you know, automation failures. Yeah. Um, it just happens that... that well, you if know, you can automate against like 80% of cases, I mean, that's a product, you know? Yeah. So, and the sad but part, right, Operator is that, training can't, isn't always easy. The sad part is that the public suffers. I think that's the, that's the awful part of the whole thing, right? Is that, you know, we were trying to make people safe and, and in many ways it does make people safer, but it feels really bad when you engineer something that ends up hurting people. And that's something that we struggle with, I think, as a society is like, we try our best to make something better and we end up accidentally with this, this system or sometimes, you know, sometimes it's driven by greed, right? I'm not going to pretend like it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a challenge. And I think we as engineers are obligated to try to fight that as much as we can, you know, to, you know, do, but you want to do the right can. thing. Yeah. But I think what you're coming up against, I mean, you kind of alluded to it with greed is, is, you know, it's often budget and, Oh, yeah. I mean, because you get exponentially more expensive. Like, Space more... Shuttle Challenger, yeah. right? We talked about that. That wasn't a cheap. It, was a... it wasn't, but they wanted to fly. Yeah. You know, they wanted to go. They got hasty. They, you know, they ignored the engineers' safety recommendations. That what was the number call. of engineers that thought, like, something might go wrong? It was, it was ridiculously, it was either 1 in 100 or 1 in 10, according to Feynman's survey. Yeah, I, Morton Thiokol, I think, was the, they had recommended against it or something along those lines. I can't remember. Somebody who allegedly knew what was going on had said, don't launch. And they did it anyway. Um, it, it sucks, right? It absolutely sucks. It, it would be nice if we could, <laughs> in an ideal world, we wouldn't have this kind of issues with it, but we do. And, you know, to the extent that you and I can stop that, you know, we have a duty to you know, do our best to, to fight against it. That's tough. Yeah, I um, agree. Safety culture is a big thing, right? It's, you want to engineer products that do no harm as much as possible, right? You it's know, not it's, always it's easy. A... I mean, you have to harden against some edge cases. I almost crashed a Tesla one time. I, I don't know if I've talked about this before, but <laughs> I, I, was, I was in the Bay Area and somebody let me drive their Model X and they didn't tell me it didn't know how to handle a roundabout at the time. And so I just was about to crash in, and the person was like, catch it! You know, so at the last minute, I, I steered around. But wow. I, if they hadn't said something, I would have crashed into that thing. Man. Do you think it, I mean... Just forgot that one, did they? I mean, just nobody told me, right? Like, I just assumed... I mean, but Tesla, been Tesla programmers a forgot car. about it, or...? I guess, but there wasn't, like, a warning, or, like, an I don't know what that is, and, you know... Hopefully I don't get sued for this, but, you know... That's but see that's the I kind of thing I'm talking happened. about, I I, you know, it's you know a, yeah. right? Somebody when they came up with the idea of self driving cars said this will be really cool. We're gonna have a self driving car and people will be able to just not touch the wheel. And someone else forgot their roundabouts yeah. <laughs> happened. Or Every or they then. just couldn't feasibly get it into that release because they wanted to fly. Sure. And yeah. so, you know, um, you know, the marketing department just didn't communicate that bit to a dude like me that, I mean, maybe they told it to the people that bought the Teslas and it was communicated to, to the owner, but as somebody just test driving someone else's car, you know, came off as an edge case. And yep. Yeah. I just didn't know. <laughs> it's, it, it's, uh, it's tough to want to design something and improve society yeah. and simultaneously grapple with the fact that, you know, if you don't do it right, well, it's hard to know quarters, you run into this. How safe is safe it. enough. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's a challenging one kind of constantly because if you're so risk adverse, you just won't release anything. Like, I mean, the ultimate extreme of that is, you know, just never do anything because someone might get hurt. Of course. And then on the other side, right, I mean, you're cavalier as all, and everybody gets hurt. So. Remember, 
Cars were invented before seatbelts. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that says it all right there, right? You know, yeah. my mom and dad, they didn't wear seatbelts as kids. Oh, wild. Wow. Like that, that recently. They didn't wear seatbelts as adults until they had to, you know? <laughs> um, and certainly airbags were not a thing for a long time, you know? That, so, yeah, it's, it's tough like that to, to have to grapple with. I think that in the 21st century, we are going to continually be bitten by this issue of like trying to, you know, come up with the next best thing. And how do we also like not do the wrong thing at the same time, you know? And, yeah. and that's, that's not an easy question to answer. We're not going to answer it tonight, you know? <laughs> we're not going to answer it tomorrow or next year either. But, yeah, um, yeah. Well, even as an as industry, we're not always going to get it right, unfortunately. And, and there are going to be failures. I mean... Yeah, I either think, intentional or unintentional. You know, there's there's yeah. ethics issues with it. There's yeah. a whole bunch of ethics things. Well, I think the ethics comes in when you, when you know it could be a problem. Yeah. But I, I guess in every one of these cases, somebody probably... If the whole field realizes there could be an issue, yeah, you you but got a degree in computer science. Again, if you if you just listen to every would be issue, I mean, you're just you know like that kind of runs the risk of becoming too pessimistic. So I don't know where the line is. But I don't sorry. either. Yeah, yeah, I don't either. And so you have the computer science degree. I'm sure you no doubt took some kind of course on ethics or, or talked about talked about some I, I did when I got my business degree, yeah. ironically, but never okay. for my computer science degree. Computer science and then has I did for my robotics degree. Ones. There was a robotics ethics course I had to take and there was a business ethics course that was stupid that I had to take. <laughs> computer science has some very interesting examples of issues that people did not think were a big deal. One of them that's very interesting, of course, is the, the stock market. They have those trading bots. Oh, interesting. And there's that one firm that lost like a, mi a, a whole bunch of money, <laughs> millions of dollars, like <laughs> lots of money, because they there's a bug <laughs> in the trading bot. Yeah, you that know, makes sense. Buy high, sell low. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that simple, but uh, that happens in there. The The more like... Uh, malevolent one was the uh, the radiation therapy machine, the Therac 25. What was the Therac 25? Look that one up. Can, you, you, can you give me the cliff notes? Chance. It's a, it was the one of the first digital radiation therapy machines for treating, you know, certain types of cancers and ailments. It makes sense. And it was... <laughs> It was the first digital machine, so first one that used circuits, right? Instead of just mechanical interlocks. Oh, interesting. I think you can see where this is going. There was a Not lack yet. of digital interlocks that allowed the machine to accidentally be programmed to inject like way more radiation dose than is safe. Oh, interesting. And patients died. Where that had been protected against mechanically before? Yes. Where mechanically it was safe, digitally it was unsafe. And because that's they just didn't build in the right safety system. Because they didn't build in the safety system. Because they had the one programmer who was a hobbyist programmer. Ah, Jesus Christ. Didn't, you know, set up the, the you know, this is before, you know, right, the, the FDA has lots of safety measures to protect us because of this particular case. Oh, it, when did this happen? Like that's decade like, wise. Was the 80s, I want to say. Okay, that's that sort of makes sense. 80s, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And we So that's why it costs like 200 million dollars to get a robot through FDA clinical it, trials now. It is because it and that's, you know, those are the kinds of things that, that yeah. we as engineers have to deal with is is, you know, because we want one programmer was allowed to program yeah. an entire medical robot. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, so these are the kind of things we have to deal with. And I, I think about it, you know, often because, like, I work in flight safety. And, you know, these are the kinds of issues that I grapple with, right? Am I doing the right thing? Am I, are we, you know, being ethical about this? Are we representing what we know about the situation well? And, and I think that that's not just flight safety. It's robotics. It's space science. It's everything that we talked about. It's, oh, um, for sure. It comes into play in robotics. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of times... You know, I've worked on a system where I've thought, you know, we can't release this in its current form. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so it's very interesting. And I but that's not only really safety. That also gets to quality. I mean, because sometimes lives aren't at stake, but you just don't want to release a shitty product. Other times it totally is safety. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> someone's going to eventually get killed if this 
scales up in this form. Yeah, you know, we it's your reputation. Yeah. We talked about that earlier. Well, I mean, you'll also, or... like, consequence-wise, reputation aside, I mean, that'll ruin you, but you'll get sued off the planet. I mean, like, if, yeah. if, you, if you okay a system <laughs> like that, just if you're a totally selfish dick that doesn't care about hurting people, I mean, there's still reasons not to do it. Absolutely, and and you know I'm not that. I mean, I'm, no, I, yeah. I know you're not. I haven't yeah. down for a second. I think it's a. Uh, I think that's just it highlights the 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 interesting issues being engineers, right? This is something that people in you know other careers ostensibly don't have to deal with. Well, much, you know, I, I talked like, about this with my ex, who's a nurse. <laughs> Music producers yeah, are not grappling. I just with had a music same, producer on the podcast. <laughs> music producers are not grappling with the same life and death consequences of you know hitting the wrong key on a piano yeah. <laughs> versus hitting the wrong the key on a note. keyboard. You know, yeah. it's two different k- kinds of keyboards that deal with that. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting. Uh, yeah. It's a career we live in. That's a good point. I, the medical professionals I talk to have an interesting take on this. Um, like I told my dad I was stressed in grad school one time and he goes, you're stressed. Try operating on a patient with a 10 minute tourniquet time that could bleed out at any moment. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. I, I think that medicine, medicine is definitely the gold standard of that, right? Yeah. You know, those are people who are highly educated. Engineering can be. Engineering like, can be. Yeah, I saw that Chernobyl thing on HBO and that made me think of like, oh God. This yeah. stuff can go terribly wrong. Yeah, like Chernobyl. That's, that's a good one to get you thinking about engineering ethics, because, I mean, that's that's like a real life example of you know tons of people dying because of an epic fuck up. And yeah, it's that, and, and Chernobyl also. The other thing about Chernobyl is that and just showed poor safety culture. That showed the world that nuclear power is the responsibility of every country in the world, not just the country that owns the nuclear power, right? Because you know who was really upset about Chernobyl? Fucking was Germany. Poland, Germany, <laughs> right? You know, I, I, any of these other countries in the neighboring area of Chernobyl were. were you know, I don't know if it is their responsibility, but it is their problem. It's their problem, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's their interest. Just to quote one of my buddies from NASA, it's not a responsibility, but it is our problem. It, at the very <laughs> least, it's their it's their problem. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Three Mile Island is another interesting one. Three Mile yeah. Island, that underscores what we talked about with conciseness and clarity. The Three Mile Island was uh, event was a case study in how a control room for a nuclear reactor can be so confusing the operators can't reasonably respond to to issues. Is that what happened? Uh, it it was a contributor. It was listed as a very significant contributor. The computer at Three Mile Island was so slow at printing out because it had dot matrix printer. It was like it's old. It was like the sixties or seventies. Yeah. Dot matrix printer. That it probably was, was high tech for the time. I mean, dot was, matrix printer yeah. in the sixties. That's posh. It was so slow that it was printing errors out hours after they were occurring. Oh, wow. There were thousands of errors that were occurring, and that thing just kept printing them, but it wasn't fast enough. And that was the only display they had. It was one of the only displays. And if they had if they had the printer printing at an adequate rate, they may have been able to stop it. That was, that was one of the... Wild. Yeah, it was one of the issues. The other one, of course, it was faulty indications, and um, you know, it was a pump valve, some kind of valve in the line that had failed open, even though it indicated oh, interesting. closed. That was the root cause mechanically. And they had redundant valves where they could have dealt with it. They did. From if, they the had, control room. if they had known the issue, they could have stopped it. But what they ended up doing was getting rid of all the cooling water um, because they thought they had too much cooling water. Because. And they accidentally had no I, cooling water. Interesting. That's what happened. But it's because they got confused. And, yeah. and we studied that at Michigan. We studied that as a case study in um, clarity of design for, you know. The human factors in in your your. We studied the Sony Ibo and the Sealed Air Corporation at CMU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, much less uh, less tragic. <laughs> in fact, they, the the damning thing about Three Mile Island is that a report was released years earlier than the accident, saying this control room is confusing, and if an incident occurred that let that was because of faulty indications, they probably wouldn't catch it. That's exactly what happened. Wait, before it had happened. Before it happened, yeah. Wild. Yep. So at least we had the checks and balances in place to know. We did. <laughs> and not do anything about it. <laughs> we could have caught it. You know, we could have caught it, but yeah. you know, it's... it's uh... What was the report? Was it like some student doing a project or like was it oh, like something credible? Oh, who was president uh, at the sorry, time? Sorry, students. 
Was it who was president at the time? Was Jimmy Carter? I'm not sure. That would have been the '60s. Jimmy Carter was in. Yeah, it might have been Jimmy Carter. Whoever was president at the time had a commission to investigate it, and uh, that was their commission, if I'm not mistaken. And that was before anything happened. Right. Uh, no, that that investigation was after it happened, but yeah. they drudged up that report. Otherwise, but like who say, did the report? Was it like anybody anyone would have listened? It to? It might have been an engineer. I'm not oh, okay. sure. There was just one engineer that was like, "This is shitty." Yeah, I'm pretty sure they didn't listen. Yeah, but like, when do you? That, that again, that brings up like the noise filter. Like, when when is it just some pessimist, and when is it something that, like, how do you know? Like, where's your low pass or your? I guess your high pass. Yeah. Sorry, low pass. Yeah, it, maybe I'm wrong. I you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. Yeah. I absolutely know what you mean. I think you're looking for low pass. But yeah, <laughs> I didn't finish that controls thing, so I, you know, don't let's, don't take my word for it. But, yeah, thanks. Um, I think that. Yeah, low pass. You're right. I think to your point, right? You cannot have paralysis by analysis. You know, that's that's the moniker they use for that. Is is that you cannot be paralyzed by analyzing that system that you never build it. It's but easier said than done not to be. Not okay to put people's lives at risk either, you know, knowingly especially. And, and yeah. somebody designed that control room and they didn't do a good enough job at Three Mile Island. Yeah, there's a lot of... They probably didn't look at it as design when they did it. Like, I feel like there's a lot of design just being sent to engineering teams that have no business doing human factors. And, like, I don't know. You see that a little bit in industrial automation and... You see that like a little bit in, I mean, a lot, a lot of robotic stuff for like early prototypes has it, but it, it's weird when something like that makes it like to a certain stage. I don't know. Like there's a whole discipline called industrial design and user experience that exists to create, to prevent those kind of problems. And a big thing that I try to evangelize is, you know, using that as much as possible because it's not that difficult to dredge up a designer and, and do a design study. And I think that design, I don't even know what it is. I guess it's a field of study. Yeah, it's a whole field of study. That field of study exists because of things like Three Mile yeah. Island, because of things. I don't like think it used to be like, like a regarded field of study. And I still have yeah. colleagues that are more old school that regard design as sort of like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like they're like, to me, that's like a mechanical draftsman, you know? And I'm like, ah, I don't think you understand what design is. But I think it. Part of it is asking that simple question of, like, how could a human being mess this up? Taking the time to pause <laughs> and think about that, you know. How even if they don't have a design do degree, like, how could any person think this was okay? But yeah, I know that manufacturing is often like that. But there's a whole subspecialty in manufacturing about how you manufacture something in such a way that when it's assembled, it minimizes the chances of being assembled wrong. Yep. Yeah, poke yoke interfaces and yep. such. Uh-huh. And, you know, squares, holes, you know, yep, yep. whatever you need to do to help somebody who might be on five or six hours of sleep, you know, build this. Maybe still drunk from the night before. With the least amount of trouble, you know. Yep. It's, 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 uh... And that's interesting, Ben. You know that it didn't start off that way, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure it did. That, that was developed somebody because somebody fucked it up somebody because something up. symmetrical got Absolutely. put in the wrong direction. Absolutely. Yeah. Apparently, the first time they turned on like a B twenty nine bomber, the controls were inverted <laughs> on the turret because uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. the wiring was so complicated and didn't incorporate any of that. Checklists uh, yeah. for flight pilot checklists were invented because somebody forgot to do something. That's interesting. And crashed. I still do checklists at work. I mean, I I, I use them when I'm going, especially if I'm doing like a site visit or. Anything in the field, I'll write up a checklist and, and follow it, you know, just to make sure I have the right tools with me and I do everything I'm supposed to do while I'm there. Yep. As you should. Well, yeah. che- I, <laughs> there's a whole book called The Checklist Manifesto. Great nice. book. Awesome Sounds like book. that one I should be reading. Yeah. It's a doctor, I think, that wrote it, if I'm not mistaken. That's interesting. Um, it was an interesting book. Like a surgeon? Um, yeah. I want to say so. Cool. Yep. Um, there's a reason they do that, right? Aviation does that. Uh other fields of engineering absolutely do that as well. I just know that I think in aviation is where it like got pioneered and certainly in flight in flight, right? That's like the, the golden example of, you know, here's where checklists are a must. Yeah. You pilots do that. It. Yeah. Medicine, no doubt. 
It was also similar. Yeah, the nurses have that stuff. Uh, the nurse I was dating was telling me all these checklists they had to run through. So yep. yeah, it seems to be seems to be a thing. Absolutely. And then apparently, like certain physicians and other nurses will try to override it, and it's. I mean, it's like what you said with ethics. Like you yeah. know, it's your job to be like no. <laughs> No. <laughs> or my favorite, right? It's like, I don't know why we do this. You know, which, you know, why is this in the checklist? Let's just skip it, right? You yeah. Know, it's there for a reason. My Somebody man. thought it over. Yeah. It's there for a reason. Somebody put it there. Yeah. And uh, and if it doesn't want to be there, maybe like, you know, request, you know, a review. But, sure. Yeah. Request a review. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, we should always review the checklist, but yeah. don't ever skip it, you know, when you're in the middle of, you know, whatever it is you're doing because... Yeah. Like, God one of the things you. they do, apparently, is, like, a count of instruments after a surgery. Yep. Where, yeah, they try yep. to, yeah, they see if, like, everything's accounted for and not inside the patient. Yep. And then if the count is off for whatever reason, they have to x-ray the patient. Unless the instrument's below a certain size that won't show up on an x-ray, and then yeah. you can't do anything about it. Like, that's that needle's just going to be inside them forever. Hopefully it's not my surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Yuck. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> My dad's finally been telling me about like actual surgical techniques. So that both of our dads are surgeons for people listening. Yeah. If anyone gives a shit about this, but um, he started finally talking to me about that stuff. Like after years of just being like, yeah, you'd be bored by it. Now he's like telling me about like suture anchors and like different tools they use and you know like suturing up a sternum and like some of the like if somebody has to operate on a heart and you, I can't remember what it's called. Like something active. Chest expander, right? Yeah. Something or other where you have to like rip apart the chest and yep. cut the sternum down the center and then you have to suture the sternum back together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Pretty, I mean, it, yeah, the other fields use aviation and, and medicine as examples of, you know, safety cultures and, and yeah. you know, good procedural design, you know, for designing, not procedural design, but designing procedures and checklists that, that you know, guarantee or at least maximize your, your good outcomes, right? It's, yeah. How it well, it makes be. sense to me. Like, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't look at... Well, I guess I do look at aviation as an example for some things. I, I'm not familiar enough with the safety techniques that I, I'm able to adapt those in my in my day-to-day -day work. I, I've cribbed some stuff from medicine from different medical professionals I've been related to or friends with. But, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I've been kind of enjoying working with the person I told you about that used to work for your company, Um at, you know, the recent engagement I found myself involved in and some of the aviation culture that he brings to the table is pretty interesting to me where I'm just like, ah, I, I like that lingo and that practice as well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. It is nice. I mean, I, I don't yeah. know. It, it's, yeah, when you are, when you're flying on an airplane, you really want to know <laughs> that people are looking out for you, you know? Oh, for sure. Things have been done in a way that guarantees or maximizes your safety and safe outcome. Yeah. Because aviation is, you know, filled with examples in the 20th century of that not happening. Yeah. And we've learned so much from it, you know, over the years. I mean, there was, there was a time in the last 10 years where there were no deaths in this country in aviation for the whole year. For a whole year. For a whole year. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. For an entire field. I mean, millions yeah. of people flying. At any given time, there's a million people in the sky on Wait, this planet. Wait, at any given time? I think every second of every day. That's wild. Yeah. That's like... It's a lot of people. I'm trying to think of it as a percent of the population, because we've got 8 billion people. Yeah, well, it's, it's so. a lot of people to be in machines that are heavier than air. Put it to yeah. that way, right? Yeah, yeah as for a sure. sobering thought to think about, you know, how consistent. Well, and the fact that their flights it. are only like, you know, one to, you know, twelve hours long or whatever, and then there'll be another million people. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. It is. Well, yeah, it's a testament. Yeah, for sure. No, it's a, it's an awesome field, and I'm jealous that you get to work on it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good stuff. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Uh, is there anything you want to plug while you're here? Anything you want to direct people to? or um, Go Blue. Beat State. Go to the University of Michigan. <laughs> That's about it. Sweet. <laughs> and I will say uh, Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. SKA.
custom robots and machines.